Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up, and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger in the night, but joy comes in the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you had established me as a strong one. You hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. The word of the Lord. Stand with me for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Gospel is a reading from St. Matthew, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said, Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. The kids can come forward for a time. We'll have a little children's message. We'll sit on the rug up here. You can that. That's great.
Okay, you go your separate way. You, can you go your separate way? Can you walk away? No, because you got the yoke on it. Gotta stay together. It's kind of hard on my back. It's not easy being a yoke. All right, that's what a yoke does. It keeps you together, right? And so when yokes, when, when you put a yoke around an ox or a horse, that means that they can do twice the amount of work because they would pull together. They would work together. Okay, so just put your put your hand around the shoulder of the person sitting next to you. All right, just put your can you put your hand around the other? Can you put your arm around the shoulder? Yeah, it keeps you together. So that together you can do twice the amount of work. So that's what Jesus was saying when he said, take my yoke upon you. So if Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, when you're working, who's with you? If it's Jesus' yoke. If it's Jesus' yoke, who's with you? God is with you, that's right. Yeah, yeah God is with you. So that's what Jesus is reminding us, that, God, that Jesus is with us. So like in church, you know, there are pastors in church, right? And sometimes pastors, they'll wear a robe, and then sometimes they'll put something over their shoulders. Have you ever been in church when the pastor had something over their shoulders? It was something that looked like this, and they were colored. And so they'd have something over their shoulders. Do you remember seeing pastors? Except it's long, I should have brought mine up. But it's a long, it's a long one, it's called a soul. Because when pastors are working, when pastors are working, it represents being together with Christ. And it's the yoke of Christ. That's what a stole is called. So pastors will wear souls. And there are different colors of souls. You'll see pastors, like now, pastors will have a purple soul on because that's the, the color of the season that we're in the blend. But sometimes the souls are red, sometimes the souls are white, sometimes the souls are green. And it represents this yoke. Because when pastors do ministry, they're doing ministry with Christ. But I was thinking, it's just not pastors that are with Christ that do ministry. You do ministry too. You've been gifted with special gifts so that you can show God's love to your brothers and sisters and your neighbors and your classmates and your teachers and your parents. So you've been given gifts too to show God's love so you're going with Christ too. So I wanted to give you a soul today. All right? You want to take a soul today? You can have a stole and you can put that around your shoulder. All right? But you might have to share. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six. I, I think I only have eight stoles here. My sewing machine broke down last night, so I only get you eight. So if you want a stole, you put it over your shoulders and it reminds you of the yoke of Christ, okay? And then you can go back to your seats. All right? Thanks for coming up today. Take one. No, there were kids at the early service that didn't want to have one of you. Jesus doesn't make you put his yoke on. He just allows you to put his yoke on. You don't have to be anything. Except I have to preach. <laughs> Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we are uh, moving uh, together in uh, this book for Lent that emphasizes our soul, or keeping our soul, caring for our soul, probably the most important thing that we can do as Christian people and as a community of faith. So we have moved along in the book entitled uh, Keeping Our Souls. We are, this week, we're moving through chapters 9 through 11. So if you haven't picked up your book, we still have books available. And uh, uh, many members are saying what a great book this is, and I agree it is a great book. So if you have pictures of it, you can still join us and uh, begin reading. This week, we're looking at chapters 9 through 11. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. And we have to remember that the people to whom Jesus spoke were primarily agricultural people. So they had a very clear idea about what a yoke was. And uh, we'll just go back to that picture, Teresa, if you wouldn't mind. Go back to that picture of, of the yoke, and that's, that's fine. So that's what they had in their mind when Jesus said yoke. It was a device to couple animals together, usually oxen, so they could do the hard work of, of agriculture. And they uh, typically, for the purpose of driving a plow or, or maybe pulling a, a cart, 
So the yoke kept them harnessed into what was difficult trudging work. And so they were able to share the work between, between the two of them. And so as Jesus was speaking to his Jewish audience, the yoke also had kind of a metaphorical power to it as well. It wasn't just this agricultural picture that, that the people were thinking of, but it brought other images. It was also a symbol of slavery for the Jewish people. Frequently the prophets would talk about the yoke of oppression or the yoke of slavery, and so the Hebrews would be reminded of the oppression that they faced, of the slavery that they endured uh, when they lived in, in Egypt. It was a symbol of slavery. When the people first went to Egypt, when Jacob brought his family there following Joseph, they were fleeing for their safety. They were fleeing from a famine. And so they went to Egypt to find food. They went to Egypt to find prosperity. They went to Egypt to find a future for themselves and, and for their families. So things started out well enough for them in Egypt, but as the generations passed, the new Pharaoh did not know Joseph and did not care about Joseph's God or the God of the Hebrew people. So he cast the Hebrews into slavery. So what started out as freedom ended up being for them slavery, the yoke of oppression, the trudging hard work of, of slavery. These were the first things that came to people's mind when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Now during Lent, there's a Catholic church in Oklahoma that ran an advertisement about people, about inviting people back to church. And the advertisement said something like, come home again. Come home, return to the church. And then it, it, it extended a particular invitation to certain types of people, and it listed these people. It extended an invitation to, the, to single people. It extended an invitation to twice divorced people, to people under 30, to the filthy rich people, to the black and proud people, to the poor as dirt people, to the people that couldn't sing, to people that were married that had pets, to the people that were older than God, to the people that were more Catholic than the Pope, to people that were passive-aggressive, to people that were obsessive-compulsive, to three times divorced people, to screaming babies, to workaholics, to bad spellers, to seekers, to doubters, to bleeding hearts, and then it finally said to you, to you, come back to church. Come to me all who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. And who is it? Who is it weary? Who is it carrying heavy burdens? Rest isn't the only thing that the soul needs, and we're learning about that. We've learned about that the last three weeks in Lent. The soul needs more than rest, but rest is one of the most fundamental needs of the soul. We all need, we all need rest, and that rest, I think, is us to overlook as far as caring for or keeping our souls. The rhythms of rest will restore us and return to us and renew in us the life of God that's found within us. So Jesus goes on to say, take my yoke upon you and learn from me because my yoke is easy. My yoke is easy. So as the Hebrew people heard this, as Jesus' disciples and the people that were listening to Jesus, they were thinking about the yoke of oppression. They were thinking about the yoke of slavery. They were thinking about the yoke of agriculture. And they were thinking, how in the world can Jesus' yoke be easy? It can't be easy. It sounds kind of like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Yokes are binding, they enslave us. It doesn't sound easy. So how do we define easy? Well, it isn't easy to define easy. But when the Greek language uses the word easy, when
when we hear the word, it doesn't, at least for the Greeks, it doesn't mean stress-free or not difficult or not burdensome. That, that, it's kind of like, well, that was an easy test, right? You hear that. Well, well, that was an easy test. We won't have to study very much because it's going to be an easy test. So that's what we usually think of when we hear the word easy, no pressure. Hey, it'll be easy, don't worry about it. Or it's an easy workout. Or sometimes easy means for us no weight. It means very convenient. It means for us instant service. Well, it, it'll be easy for, for us. But I think ironically, in trying to make our lives easier, we somehow manage to make them more difficult. And making things easier, we've actually made things uh, harder. So we have every time-saving device imaginable in this world, and, and many that were even not imagined even like 10 years ago. And yet, we don't seem to have more time. Did you have more time on your hands than you did 10 years ago? I mean, it's kind of strange when you think about it. So have these devices really created for us more time? Have they made life easier for us? We have extraordinary high-tech communication. I mean, we've got lots of communication devices. We've got little phones. We call them cell phones. Some people call them smartphones, right? Smartphones, you know, the great definition of smartphone is anything that makes you feel dumb. It's a smartphone. Somebody said this, has said that. But we've got all of these great communication devices, but we have no convenience. Things are not easy. For us. So in spite of our incredible standard of living, life is not easy. And now we have Jesus promising to make it easy with a yoke. So how is that going to work, Jesus? How does that work for us? The word easy in Greek has a connotation which simply means good. Easy means good in the Greek language. That which is good, that which is fitting would be another way to translate it. That which is fitting, it has nothing to do with convenience. It has to do with our character. That which is fitting of our character. So when Jesus says his yoke is easy, it's not because it's going to be stress-free. Life is not going to be stress-free. It's easy because it's fitting. It's the yoke that we were designed to wear. The work of goodness is hard. The act of kindness is a difficult thing to do. But it is what is fitting for us. It is what we are designed to do. It is good. I mean, it's hard to be good. It's difficult to be kind sometimes. I mean, you can think of someone today, probably, even at 11 o'clock in the morning, that you've had a hard time being kind to. And oftentimes, on Sunday morning, it gets to be our family members, right? It's not easy to be kind. It's never easy to be good. But it's what we were designed to do. The salvation of Jesus offers is not one that removes a burden. It is one that gives us the right burden to bear in our lives. Like the burdens of goodness and kindness, which are always difficult for us. So freedom is not found by doing less or by letting go of things. It is by holding or by bearing the right things in this life. Bearing goodness. Holding on to kindness, the things that are fitting, the things that make you good, the things that make you kind or easy. So remember that a yoke clings two oxen together. So that's what Jesus is offering when he says, take my yoke upon you. It is an invitation to be bound up with Jesus. So if it's Jesus' yoke you're wearing, that means that you'll go where Jesus goes. It means that you'll do the things that Jesus wants to do 
in this world. You're yoked to him. Some of the places that Jesus goes will seem like difficult places, places you'd rather not go, but places that are good for you to go, places that are good for your soul to go. But remember that if Jesus is the one that's taking you there, then it's not to break your back. It's only to witness, to see His work in the world. His work can be found in you. His work can even be found in your burdens, the things that you bear in this life. The holiness is always there, but you have to hang around Jesus to be able to see Jesus' presence with you, to recognize that Jesus is with you, that Jesus is yoked to you. And so that's why we have this emphasis. We renew our vision of this Jesus traveling with us during the season of Lent. This Jesus to whom you are yoked in your life. Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light simply because it means traveling with him. Wherever we go, through whatever difficulties, he shares those burdens with us in this life. There was once a little girl who was doing household chores around the house and she, her mother was making her do the dishes and, and of all the chores, she did not like doing dishes. And she was doing the dishes one day and so she turned to her mother and she said, Mom, will we have to do dishes in heaven? Well, we have to do dishes in heaven. And, and the mom thought about that for a while. And she said, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if we'll have to do dishes in heaven. But I know that if we do have to do dishes in heaven, we'll all like to do dishes. Isn't that a great answer? We'll all like to do the things that are a burden for us. We'll like those burdens because we know that we're with Jesus. We know that we're traveling with Jesus. You know that wherever you go, you will share this abundant life with Jesus. And you will be offered that life of eternity with Jesus. And that brings great rest for our souls.